Recording in progress. to everyone and welcome to this webinar on culture and jobs rescue support and unleash organized by the oecd and the european commission director general for education youth sports and culture and hosted by glasgow city regions and region and scotland skills uh, well yesterday we had quite a dense discussion uh, the whole day we started with uh, seeing how to build a more resilient music ecosystem in the future. Uh, and also we reviewed the impact of the crisis on the jobs and skills in creative sectors. And we analyzed how um, employment in this sector is different from other sectors. We also had quite a bit of discussion on how to improve the measurement of cultural employment so that we can better inform policies. And I think this gives quite a good background for what we're going to discuss today. And this is uh, about policies to support the creative sectors uh, and employment and jobs uh, in, in creative sectors in the times of COVID uh, uh, and beyond. Um, and we have quite a good lineup of speakers uh, with us today, and I'll introduce them now and you'll see them live in a moment. So today we have with us uh, Andrew Dobby, who is a CEO and founder of Made Brave um, in Scotland. Uh, and we really hoped to be there in Glasgow with you, but well, here we are with Zoom. Um, one of, uh, well, the other speaker is David Halabiski, my, my colleague, who is an economist in our Center for Entrepreneurship, uh, SMEs, Regions and Cities. From the Commission, we have Barbara Stacher, from Director General for Education, Youth, Sport and Culture. And we also have Josephine Hage, who is a Deputy Director of Creative uh, Saxony in Germany. <clears throat> um, one of the highlights from yesterday that I really wanted to share with you was um, were these words from uh, Janice Kirkpatrick, who is a designer and the creative director of Graven uh, in Scotland. And she said, uh, uh, well, guys, uh, what yesterday had happened, let's just move on. Uh, and I think this resonates pretty well with what we were discussing uh, with Barbara from the European Commission when we were thinking about um, the, the logic of this session. Uh, and we, we, Barbara said, well, okay, let's give it a bit of a more optimistic spin. Let's stop complaining and let's see how really policies can build now the resilience of the sector uh, for the future. So maybe that's a little bit like a, um, a spin that we can all follow throughout uh, uh, this session. Uh, I wanted to, uh, to briefly uh, provide a um, very short uh, background to set a little bit the scene uh, for our discussion. Um, and um, in OCD, we uh, recently, well, not so recently, already in September, we published a note uh, on uh, COVID-19 impact on cultural and creative sectors, where we had an overview of policy responses uh, that the governments started to introduce from March, April uh, last year. And of course, we saw that these responses were pretty unprecedented in their scale and scope. Um, and uh, we 
Um, maybe we can uh, go to the next slide, please. Um, but of course, we also underlined in that note that a more targeted support package is needed. So basically, governments introduced quite a number of measures, public funding, employment support, deferral of payments to support businesses, and also uh, some of them introduced some structural policies. Uh, um, and uh, in, in the second wave, we, we also uh, were monitoring what's happening now, and we see that uh, um, some of this, of course, continues very much so, but compared to the first wave, more funding is targeted specifically to creative sectors and not to a broad direction. Uh, and of course, there is uh, many countries are starting to introduce uh, recovery packages, and uh, they started to include also uh, culture in there. However, many EU countries still need to determine the exact spending uh, of the next generation of EU funds. And we also see that uh, funds are now being directly targeted towards digitalization in, in creative sectors. So that's maybe a bit of an update of what's happening uh, right now over the past couple of months compared to the first wave of packages. And of course, all this uh, national public support uh, programs and policies were very much complemented uh, by the action of city governments. And maybe we can go to the next slide. Uh, and also the private sector, foundations and philanthropy organizations, and of course, collective management organizations as well. Um, maybe next one. Um, in our note, we also provide a, a broad and um, sometimes quite detailed overview um, of the policy measures that are needed uh, now to support the sector through the crisis and also build its future resilience. Uh, and and I, I'll just share with you some of the um, headlines there. Of course, we need to ensure that support reaches creative professionals and firms. We need to encourage investment in cultural production, adapt uh, uh, self-employment and income support measures to new and hybrid forms of employment, widen innovation support so that they reach uh, uh, creative firms. Uh, we also need to improve access of creative firms to SME finance, address digital divides, and build on crossovers between culture, education, health and well-being, and tourism to build back better. So maybe with this uh, brief introduction, I can uh, now open our panel discussion. And I wanted to um, uh, direct my first uh, question to Josephine Hage, uh, Deputy Director of Creative Saxony in Germany. Uh, Josephine, you've been uh, pretty active from the very start of the lockdown measures in monitoring uh, the state uh, and how the creative firms in Saxony and sometimes even broader because you're part of the European Creative Business Network uh, feel and um, what is the impact uh, of the lockdown measures on creative uh, firms and professionals. Uh, and I know that you continue this uh, survey, which is quite precious for everyone to understand uh, um, how the situation varies across different sectors and what's uh, the impact. Maybe you would like to share with us uh, the results of the most recent one. Uh, please, Josephine, and welcome. Um, uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks to the OECD and the European Com Commission for inviting us. Um, we, as Creative Saxony, are, among others, part of a, a German-wide, uh, so an, a national network of promoting creative industry supporters, network promoting creative industry. It's over 40 organizations, and uh, we joined forces already in March, April last year uh, during the first lockdown to see what will be the impact uh, on the cultural and creative sector. And we um, uh, we knew the survey at the moment, um, and uh, obviously it's worse. Um, when we did our first survey uh, in spring last year, no one would have expected that in spring this year we will uh, again face a hard lockdown. Now concerts are already scheduled uh, to 2022. Uh, international touring is not possible at all at the moment. And uh, as we prognosed last year, it's not only those professions typically associated with life culture who are economically severely affected, but we also receive many responses from the design sector, for example, uh, from photographers, where the impact of the overall economic downturn can be felt. 
we called it uh, the financial crisis effect um, that led to massive reductions in market uh, marketing budgets and firms and other business sectors. So on the one hand, we have massive investments in digital tools and expertise in the overall economy. But on the other hand, even our colleagues from the independent games sector tell us that jobs in uh, the area, for example, of serious games and gamification have been produced by companies. Um, in our current um, survey, at which will um, which will be open until mid uh, February, so we expect to have results by end of February. I will uh, uh, of course share them with you. Uh, Eighty three percent of respondents say that COVID nineteen has affected their entrepreneurial activity either very negatively or rather negatively. More than fifty percent see their economic activity fundamentally threatened. Almost three quarters of respondents reacted with changes in their economic activity. So a, a good sign that um, uh, there has been a, a very um, high amount of flexibility uh, of cultural and creative entrepreneurs to react to the crisis. So, so they introduced digital tools. They went online with um, with, with concerts, uh, etc. They um, many of them also uh, used uh, webinars and seminars to uh, educate themselves further. Um, our recent survey also gives us insight into what you already quoted, Katja, into the oftentimes hybrid income situations of cultural and creative professionals. Almost a third of self-employed and respondents say they have income also from a permanent position, even though it's a part-time, uh, but um, this uh, permanent income from permanent uh, positions or socially insured positions, jobs, um, however, usually uh, only makes up a small part of the overall income of that person. And there's an, one uh, last thesis I want to share with you uh, is that um, we it's most likely that women seem to be more affected than men by the crisis. I will have to have a closer look at the data uh, in order to see whether this proves true. Yes, thank you very much, Josephine. And your last point, um, I think, is confirmed also by the OECD analysis on the impact uh, of the crisis on jobs overall, this uh, gender imbalance. And uh, it seems that the women are more affected. Well, sometimes, well, for this quite a basic explanation that women have to had to really uh, take care of the household and of the kids. Uh, so during the lockdown measures. Well, thank you so much. Uh, um, now I wanted to, to uh, maybe um, discuss with you a little bit. Um, of course, we saw that uh, a lot of national governments, regional governments, city governments introduced uh, massive rescue packages um, to support employment, including cultural employment. Sometimes it was targeted. Well, more, more, uh, more often it was not targeted specifically to the creative sectors, of course. And I wanted to um, have a um, a bit of a, a pick from uh, Andrew uh, and also from the Josephine as well. Um, how you think that worked? What worked well and what, what didn't work so well in this uh, policies? Andrew? Hi, hi everyone and thanks for having me. Um, so for a little bit of context for everyone, so I run a creative brand agency. So um, at the beginning of lockdown, in March last year, I had about 40 employees um, and, and my business is kind of split. We do a lot of strategic brand planning and brand creation, um, but we also do a lot of film production and content creation. Uh, a lot of our time is spent traveling all over the world and um, producing brand films for people. So in, in March last year, um, you know, very quickly, we saw a lot of our revenue disappear overnight when film production stopped. Um, and of course that was, you know, very stressful for, for everyone involved at that time. Um, and I think in the UK and Scotland, we had the furlough job retention scheme, which was introduced, which, which was great to a point, but the, the challenge with a service-based creative company is that we have contracts that we have to finish. We have projects that we had to finish. So we weren't able to put everyone on furlough and also to make sure that we had a business that would survive on the other side of lockdown we had to make sure that we could win business so i needed to keep my people in work so we were able to put some people in furlough um which was great and was a was a was a big support and it really did help us um as a business 
However, I think um, very quickly we realized that a business like ours also very much relies on the creative freelance network. And, you know, we very quickly saw the impact of a lot of the smaller freelancers and the, the, the panic that, that they, they went into because uh, a lot of their, well, when our projects got cancelled, um, you know, when we produce films, we have our core team, but we also bring in a huge freelance support for those projects. So um, what we did as an agency is we created a self-initiated uh, creative industry COVID support group on LinkedIn. And very quickly, we had 4,000 people join that group. And what I saw and learned through that was that the creative freelancers needed a voice and they needed they needed a home and they needed somebody to kind of lead and look after them. And we also joined forces with the Creative Entrepreneurs Club in Scotland. And very quickly, we built a platform and uh, worked with them where we created job boards. We created things like one-to-one -one mentoring support. So I got my whole agency to give up time to the creative network. And what we found was that was so valuable for people was actually just having people to signpost them, people to listen to. And we were, we were just giving away half an hour, an hour of our time, but we did it to hundreds of people. And there was something, you know, so, so the money, I suppose my point is the monetary part is, is one element, but there's also the, the mental health, the signposting support that is very, very important. And just to have a listening ear and someone to try and point you um, in, a, in, a, in a right direction. And I think another element um, that I found very, very helpful as a business was um, we were able to access CBIL's uh, loan funding. And now, of course, we were very aware that any loan that we took or fund as a business was going to have to go back. So I was very conscious to my team to say we don't want to spend this. But I think what's very important about when you offer and are able to give a business um, cash funding for the bank is that it takes your brain out of survival mode. And you're suddenly not in fight or flight because you know you have a cushion in the bank and you're able to positively um, think about solutions. And one other point is that where furlough has been great is yes, we can support people, but the negative impact of furlough is that when you send people and they're not able to work while they're being funded, they suddenly feel useless because they cannot help their teammates. And um, as a business, we cannot solve our problems because we are then in the hamster wheel of finishing the projects that we have and we're unable to solve problems. So in an ideal world, I would have loved the furlough support where we could have supported some of the salaries, but we could have had the people working on problems to get us out of, of any challenges that we have. Yes, yes, that's very insightful. Um, and of course, well, you underline this uh, problem of, of freelancers and we also had a similar um, feedbacks when we were discussing uh, the work of museums and uh, this concerns also theatres, opera, operas, festivals, that they, all of them rely on this network of uh, freelance professionals uh, who provide services, goods for um, these institutions and firms. So that, that's a, a, a really uh, an important po point to make. And I, I this is also remind, when you were speaking, how you try to manage quickly to organize yourselves to support also the freelancers. Um, this um, reminded me of the, uh, this thing, I lost my gig. I don't know if you heard about this in Austin. They mm -hmm. also provided a platform. I'll, I'll share the information maybe also with the participants on this. They provided a platform. That it's, it's related to this huge Austin uh, in the US festival. Um, uh, and when people realized that it's canceled and a lot of revenues were dependent on that, they started to provide a platform for all who participated and uh, people um, evaluated the, the lost uh, income and people started to uh, try to compensate for that so that was really and this was um, copied then in in many parts of the world as well um, and of course when you um, underline the mental health issue that's that's really an, an important point and i also take your point that sometimes maybe it's more useful to direct uh, not so much uh, provide funding for unemployment supports but maybe to keep people in in in, in the job somehow yeah. yeah josephine what's your reaction on this and what's uh, what's your overall uh, um, evaluation no, uh, on what worked well and what didn't work well over the past year almost in terms of policy supports?
Ah, I think uh, the gods of technology left us for, for a second together with Josephine, but maybe uh, while we wait for Josephine to reconnect and I'm sure she will. Um, can I maybe turn to Barbara now? Um, and Barbara, uh, maybe it's also good to take a bit of a longer uh, term perspective um, and uh, see, maybe you can share with us also what needs to be done to support um, creative sectors and creative professionals uh, in the future and what are the um, European Commission priorities here and next steps in, in this field. Barbara, uh, please. Maybe you need to unmute. Yes, hello. Welcome. Thanks and welcome to everybody. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. So I'll quickly um, browse the issue about what, what is being done. Um, sorry. Yes. So now, since uh, two days, uh, there is a new study by Ernst and Young. Uh, commissioned by JSAC and other cultural creative networks, which even show a, a worse picture of how badly uh, COVID, the COVID crisis has affected cultural and creative sectors. So uh, in any case, what has been done at EU level is also is quite unprecedented because lots and lots of money have been made available through the member states. So if you get paid out some unemployment additional benefits, it, you may not know that actually part of it is uh, financed through the EU budget. For example, under the temporary support to mitigate unemployment risks uh, in emergency, that's the SURE program, it's 100 billion euro. And there is the Corona Response Investment Initiative of 37 billion euro. And uh, there have been other other special regimes, but they are, of course, uh, dished out via, mem via member states, local authorities. So uh, you will see, hopefully, funds raining down also to, to your end. Uh, what else has been done? For example, the, the Creatives Unite platform we have established uh, together with the cultural and creative sectors. I think, Andrew, it would be super interesting if you could share your initiative there. There is a contribute button, so you can directly uh, contribute your link there, because I think that we can really, there is a lot to be learned. And uh, yeah, and Austin, of course, uh, Katarina can also be there because it's, a, it's, it's also it has been a lot of uptake also for, uh, on, from the US and from other countries in the world so that and the OECD of course yeah so uh, that would be uh, welcome now concerning the EU funding period there's also quite a, a huge amount of uh, of uh, loans and and grants and new money which has been made available so the uh, new long term budget is 1074 trillion euro for the next uh, funding period 21 to 27 and centerpiece is a 700 billion extra funds next generation eu with the uh, recovery and resilience facility so member states in other words are now presenting to the eu additional act actions that they want to fund and actually a lot of member states are presenting programs which include culture and also freelancers uh, support to the tourism and the, the gig industry in general so here you would need to to lobby also with your member state to see how exactly you know what exactly did they include and uh, because there's a lot of money available and it's 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 still open it's at the moment currently being negotiated so yeah also, the different EU programs have been increased, especially on the cultural and creative uh, and investment side. Erasmus, here you can see the numbers. Of course, here we are in a wider audience in the EU, but uh, there are also many countries which are non-EU members which are eligible to some of those programs. Now, the Council Work Plan for Culture, talking about the, the, the difficult uh, working conditions or ac actually living conditions, of cultural and creative uh, sector professionals, the freelancers have been mentioned. There is also in the council work plan for culture, there is included to look more at this issue from a more you know, um, structured perspective with member states also. Uh, so we have started 
by doing a study uh, which has been published uh, last, uh, well, a month ago, together with networks directly, with Culture Action Europe, performing artists, um, Pearl, uh, IETM, Free Muse, and other partners. Uh, it's about artists' working conditions. Here's the link. Uh, you can uh, have a look. It's very interesting. Why is it interesting? Because it also provides what you're saying, Andrew and other people, it provides it from a more structured pers perspective. So how does it look like in different countries? What is the, the legislation recognizing or not re recognizing artists status, the social security legislation, tax measures? Um, are there agreements in place, bilateral ones under the OECD article 17? Uh, all kinds of issues. So it might be interesting. For example, here I copy and pasted the table where you can see, for example, uh, how does it look like for the self-employed, for the freelancers that you were mentioning, Andrew, in different countries? How is the this, the the social security legislation? Do they receive unemployment benefits, pension supplements? So that is different in each country. Of course, the EU has no competences to legislate what artists can receive in each country because uh, you know that's the countries who have to decide but here at least through this kind of comparisons you will see that in some countries they are covered in some countries they are not so actually it also can provide a few arguments of saying well why if if bulgaria can cover uh, them us why cannot uh, scotland or whoever, whoever you know uh now we just published uh, two days ago a link so you can also voice and and contribute with uh, what you, you would like to say it's uh, a civil society voices of culture dialogue about exactly these issues statues and working conditions of artists and cultural and creative professionals so if you click on this link you can register your name deadline to participate is the 21st of uh, february so you still have some time and what will be the result? The result is uh, that, uh, yeah, exactly what Andrew, you have been saying, uh, how, how did you do things and what is your critique or what is your opinion and uh, what to do exactly. So here is the link. Just to say in general, uh, culture and creative sectors and the industries, they have been quite successful in the past years to get into all, all sorts of policies. So for example, whereas a few, no, only two years ago, I would say 80 regions have chosen CCIs as a priority in the smart specialization strategies. Now it is more than 120. So from a regional perspective, regional authorities are becoming increasingly aware that culture and creative sectors are not are not a burden, actually. They can help and they can um, be part of urban revitalization, that if you um, if you put out a lot of money to revi revitalize a declined industrial area, you might as well talk to the sectors and to the people <laughs> and not just do glitzy buildings. So uh, a lot of uh, things have been done. Uh, Katarina, I think I have to finish. So <laughs> just to mention that um, there is also on the regional uh, files we're doing a lot of um, good practice learning with cities and regions on culture and creativity and here you see also the OECD uh, our joint policy project of which this conference is, is an example and also are other things and well just to say that as Professor Sacco yeah I, I put this slide here because of what Professor Sacco said yesterday in one of the other panels uh, cohesion well-being culture so culture can also, uh, you know, th there is the intrinsic value of culture, that's for sure. I mean, there is cultural creation which should never be questioned. In addition to that, uh, there can be additional funds and additional possibilities to make an income also by assuming other roles, uh, you know, in, in difficult neighborhoods, in schools, with migrants. So I think more and more we're also moving into that direction and spreading out uh, whatever is possible. Yeah, thank you. And just to mention that here, uh, one of the participants is also um, from the Commission, Silvia Draghi. She is, uh, she's here. Hello, Silvia. So they are also doing lots of things on entrepreneurship and SME support and uh, culture and creative ecosystems and skills. So uh, actually nowadays it's difficult to say where culture and creative 
sectors are not because they are in research, they are a centerpiece of, of SME support. So kind of they're everywhere, but some people say they're everywhere and, and nowhere. So we, we need to make sure that actually that actually uh, everybody can benefit and, and know all the opportunities. Yeah, thank you so much, Barbara. And uh, well, I, I like that you highlighted uh, that well, culture and creative sectors um, is being mainstreamed across uh, and well, it's wider social and uh, uh, impact uh, by other policies and that uh, a lot of European regions are putting it uh, at heart of their regional smart specialization strategies. Well, there were 80 in the past. Now you say there are 120, so that's quite encouraging because it, it is a clear sign that uh, um, people are understanding culture not as a liability, uh, as a burden, as you said, but more as an investment. No, uh, but Barbara, um, uh, Josephine, sorry, I wanted to go back to you um, uh, with this uh, question and your um, evaluation of uh, uh, how policies were well suited, not so well suited. Uh, uh, to support um, employment in the cultural and creative sectors over the past uh, year. So what are your main conclusions? Um, um, and we, we had some inputs um, uh, from Andrew, and maybe you can take over from, from that part of the discussion. Would love to. Thank you, Katya, for giving me the floor again. Um, I would really love to, to build on what Andrew said. In, in Germany, there has been a certain amount of frustration <laughs> because um, most of the economic support schemes uh, did not really work for solo entrepreneurs um, because they were um, given uh, social benefits and there has been a frustration because um, most of those persons never relied, relied on social benefits benefits in their lives before and so there um, even artists who would never before have said uh, I'm an entrepreneur of course um, uh, suddenly um, uh, it made a strong case for advocacy that uh, they are an entrepreneur and uh, lobbied for that they would uh, have access to uh, economic support schemes as well um, so this is uh, yeah and it's not completely solved yet. There is a certain uh, a program now for solo entrepreneurs uh, starting uh, now in, in January on, on the national level, but you asked for the regional level and I would um, like to, to highlight what went well um, because the, the COVID-19 crisis has definitely been a push for advocacy for cultural and creative, for the cultural and creative sectors. We see that a lot of new networks have been formed within the creative industries and that uh, our creative industries as sensations have been part of uh, local crisis teams. Um, so there, are, for example, here in Leipzig, we had a crisis team consisting of the business support um, department and the cultural department and our association was a natural member of that uh, crisis team. Uh, so their bottom up structures were heard uh, and they were strengthened um, in the course of the crisis. Um, Andrew mentioned uh, the low threshold um, access to loans. Um, and naturally, many of our stakeholders uh, did not want to have these loan schemes because they said, I don't know when, I, when am I ever going to pay this back. But <laughs> we also had such a low threshold loan scheme in our region. And, you know, we've been lobbying for easy access to finance for the cultural and creative sector for so long. And it's, there's never been a way into, you know, how the banking system works, the banks, they don't have... Um, uh, really, and uh, yeah, the banks are very hesitant in in giving loans to to cultural and creative companies, and uh, this very low threshold access to to finance. I hope that this is a scheme we can take into the future in order to ease access to to finance in the long run. Um, uh, Andrew also mentioned the state of shock that. Um, uh, yeah, that was that was present in March, April last year. In our region, um, we had an interesting scheme and um, invested in innovation at a very early stage. We um, were we drafted a concept for a, a competition for the event sector that has been 
obviously hit very hard economically by the COVID-19 crisis. And um, we, we hosted this competition in order to say, okay, now it's time to invest in new models, a new concept, try, you know, how, how does the audience react to hybrid models? There's been a huge insecurity in the market. So because no one knew how would the audience react to these hybrid models, what will they willing, uh, what will the audience uh, be willing to pay for these new models. And so this was a uh, um, companies and associations from the event sector could apply for funding in order to sort of test case uh, new, new models in the event sectors. And that worked really well and they can spend um, the money uh, they received through this uh, competition also this year. So they didn't have to do it uh, last year. Uh, and um, also in reaction to, you know, uh, to this shock moment, I know many regions did this as well, was a scholarship model, but very open, not only to the core, uh, for core artistic professions, but, you know, really also for filmmakers and uh, cultural managers, etc., to develop new concepts and do artistic research, because it, we said we have, we have to invest now at a very early stage in you know, and what cultural and creative entrepreneurs can, can do best. And it is working. So I would really uh, encourage um, what, what Andrew said. Um, also the, the schemes with, um, um, you know, support for, uh, for jobs did not really work because, uh, you know, people wanted to, to work and not just, you know, lay back and... <laughs> and live off as a state aid you know it's not the self-understanding of the sector yeah so that's some experiences from my region i wanted to share yeah you know thank you thank you so much um, josephine uh, and, and well you mentioned this advocacy uh, uh push uh, that you you saw in in um, uh, saxony and the, yeah I, I think what we have uh, we heard the same thing from uh, World Cities Culture Forum that many cities they really pushed for this advocacy and they um, some of them even investment uh, invested in uh, impact assessment studies uh, in well New York London and some other country, uh, some other cities as well so that's uh, one of the important points. Well, a lot um, was already said uh, on the importance to provide support for freelancers for these self-employed uh, professionals. The share of whom is very high in, in cultural and creative sectors. And uh, today we have with us um, David Halabiski, who is really leading this uh, work in the OECD on well, inclusive entrepreneurship and more in particular also on self-employment for quite a number of years. Um, and David, over the past year almost, no, starting from spring, uh, you have been analyzing um, uh, OECD country approaches to support self-employed through the crisis. And maybe you can share with us how these approaches evolved and uh, which maybe are the countries that were the most successful in injecting diversity and flexibility in their measures. And maybe you can also give us some examples that, uh, uh, of countries that were successful in catering for these hybrid new forms of employment in their measures. And maybe also, you, I guess you have also some lessons and recommendations um, to share with us on how to improve these policies going forward. Well, David, uh, welcome. Mm. And, uh, good, good morning. Thank you for having me today. It's a real pleasure to be joining the panel this morning. And um, what I'll try to do is, is respond to your, your group of questions with a little story that I'm going to tell. Uh, so I'll tell you a story about how policy for self-employment has evolved over the past year or year and a half in response to COVID-19. Now, of course, the, the main policy priority has been to protect health and ensure that um, we are containing the virus. And that policy response has caused uh, negative impacts on the economy. And so now we have also uh, a full suite of economic policies. And it's a rather interesting tension because we're both pushing and pulling on the economy at the same time. But of course, in terms of economic policy, the priority for most governments has been to protect firms and protect employment, so to save jobs, basically. Now, the responses have varied greatly across countries. And if we look at the types of measures used, um, there are measures that are aimed at firms. Uh, and these include a full range of um, financial measures, usually things like grants, 
tax credits, loans, loan guarantees, uh, deferrals on debt repayment, rent, tax payments, social security, uh, as well as measures that are aimed at employees, uh, furlough schemes or improved access to furlough schemes. Uh, some countries like the US have given money directly to people. So the question is, where do the self-employed fit into this picture? And it's not an easy story to tell because they are treated both as firms and as employees at the same time. And the result is that they usually qualify for neither uh, types of support, those for firms or for employees. And the initial rollout of, of programs and schemes uh, was not really aimed at the self-employed. And um, the result was they were not very well covered by any of the schemes. And the difficulties were really due to three points. One was eligibility criteria in that support for firms was often based on a revenue threshold, which the self-employed and freelance workers could not meet. Or it was based on previous tax returns, which of course excludes those who are relatively new in their business activity, or perhaps those with fluctuating incomes. And the third reason is the mechanisms in which these schemes were delivered were often through institutional arrangements that the self-employed don't use. Uh, so small business loan programs, uh, schemes delivered through banks. And so at the beginning of the crisis, the self-employed really fell through the cracks. And it's important to also highlight that the impacts were uneven on the self-employed. Uh, they're uneven by sector, but also by different types of self-employed. It was already noted earlier that women were impacted uh, more heavily than men, and that's certainly true among entrepreneurs as well, partly due to the sector that they work in, uh, partly due to how household responsibilities are managed, but also due to reasons such as um, the support network and the ecosystem that provides support to female entrepreneurs or other groups were, were also directly impacted. So, you know, as Andrew said, um, the support networks were also directly impacted, uh, which has also a negative consequence for the entrepreneurs. Now, before we get too critical about the initial policy response, we have to recall that this was done very quickly. Uh, there was a concern about how do we get uh, money to workers, to firms very quickly uh, to provide them with support. Uh, there was a question about how long is this crisis going to last? Uh, there were great concerns about uh, fraud and false claims. And so the, the choice that was made in most cases was to, to use a general one size fit all approach uh, in that speed was the priority. Now, the good news is that over time, uh, this evolved and the approaches changed and we saw more targeted approaches uh, done by sector, or by type of activity. And um, countries like Italy went beyond providing liquidity support to try to also provide different schemes that aim to replace lost income. And also many countries adjusted the eligibility criteria, both making it easier to access support for those who fell through the cracks and also making it more difficult uh, for those to access support who did not necessarily need the support. So they added criteria about household income and, and so on. Now, how did this work? Was it effective? It's really too early to tell, but we do know a few things. We know that in countries like the Netherlands, the reach was actually very high. Uh, they estimate about one quarter of the self-employed were using the support schemes, uh, which is quite remarkable. But we also know that there are still difficulties. Uh, hybrid types of work were not ever well accounted for. So when you ask for good examples, um, there really aren't that many. Uh, in countries like Italy, they use such a wide suite of approaches that um, that probably was the most effective at, at reaching different types of employees doing different types of activities. But still much more needs to be done in the future. And I think a lot of the challenges around how social protection is designed and delivered in that you've got very different situations between an employee who works at a workplace that is um, managed and, and those conditions are determined by someone else versus self-employed people who are much more in control over their own working conditions. And then of course, the move uh, towards hybrid forms of work uh, creates further challenges for social protection. 
So policymakers are aware of this and some progress have been made, but there's still uh, more that needs to be done. So if we step back and try to think, what have we learned over the past year? I think uh, we've learned that self-employed have been impacted to a greater extent than employees. Uh, we know they have faced a greater risk of job insecurity. But we also see they've been quite resilient. Uh, surveys tend to suggest, as, as other panelists have noted already, that many have been able to change their business activity to try to adapt. In terms of policy, we know that the eligibility criteria initially created large holes in the support system, uh, but we've tried to, or policymakers have tried to overcome that over the past year. And I think, you know, in the short term, and, and if such a crisis were to come up again, we need to think more about sector-based policies to try to have beggar targeted support. And then, of course, there are still questions for policymakers. And I think the two biggest ones are around business bankruptcies. Uh, they've been very, very low, record lows in most countries. And so the question is, what is going to happen when all of these supports stop? Are we going to have an explosion of business bankruptcies next year? and a massive increase in unemployment next year. And then the second question is around debt. And this has also been mentioned uh, by Josephine. Um, entrepreneurs have incurred a lot of debt over the past year because a lot of the support have been loan programs. So what are the, the consequences for that in the coming years? Are they going to be able to sustain that debt? And it's an important question for policymakers because you hear a lot of stories about how we need to build back better and um, we want to move towards a more green, sustainable and inclusive economy. And often that implies that firms and entrepreneurs are going to have to invest in their business to make those uh, types of adjustments. Uh, but they've already incurred massive amounts of debt in many cases over the past year. So there's a tension that has to be reconciled. And then of course, the big question is how do we get out of this? How do we wind down the support and uh, return to normal uh, if there is going to be a normal? So thank you. We can, we can pick up this further later on in the discussion, perhaps. Well, thank you so much, David. And uh, for our participants, I posted a link to, uh, um, if you want to learn more on the OECD work on self-employment and broader inclusive entrepreneurship issues. Um, Andrew, Josephine, I saw that you, um, well, what uh, David was saying resonated uh, quite a bit with you. I don't know if you want to make some kind of um, comments or react to what David was uh, saying. Um, maybe Josephine? Um, well, I, I, um, I agree very much with the, with the observations um, uh, of David. Um, yeah, it's, um, you, you, you pinned it down, I think. Um, um, Andrew? Yeah, I, I think first of all, what, what a, a lovely calming voice David has. I think <laughs> we just need to listen to David for the next hour and it'll keep us all calm and, and bring our stress levels down. Um, I, I think, you know, I think David's you know, a great oversight and can, and can see all the things that are pulling and pushing against each other. Um, and, and I think that's the challenge is there, it's very hard, isn't it, to kind of look at something that fits every business in, in the creative sector because they all they all think and act differently. Um, I mean, you know, as a business, you know, what I've tried to do as well is, you know, to your point, uh, Ekaterina, uh, earlier on, is that trying not to look back and to look forward. And I think the more we can shape policies and and do things to help, you know, help people plan for the future. Um, for example, as a business, very quickly, um, we launched a work from anywhere policy. So I said to my team, this is never going back to the normal of before. Everything has changed. And so we now need to get our head into what the future looks like. And so as an employer, I, I've given, you know, I'm trying to lead the way with flexibility and trust and say to my team from now on, we're going to work out, you know, um, how the new workplace will work. Now, that that comes down to everyone in my business has a different job and, it, and, and flexibility will look different for, for everyone. But I suppose maybe to my, where I'm going with my point is that the, the, the kind of support um, it, it's not always necessarily monetary support. For example, um, I, I've reached out at the moment and I'm working with multiple flexibility and, um, you, you know, kind of uh, HR policy consultants to help and support my business right now. And it's to help us figure out what the new workplace looks like. 
I've reset a vision in the business to say that we're now a global business. Everything is global and we have to think about this flexibility. And yeah, there, there's something in, and I suppose where the spark came was when David was talking about the, the sustainability aspects of things is that if we need to, we need to make sure people aren't just thinking about funding gaps right now and trying to get back to where we were before is that, we need to take the best of what we had before and the best of what we have now. There's so many benefits that if we can bring flexibility into businesses and allow people to work from home or the office, well, there's so many people that then won't be traveling on cars and buses and the environmental impacts that are so positive that, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I just think that there's, it's easy to think on money, but sometimes it's, it's, it's a lot of the softer skills that, um, and a lot of the, the other elements that we need to look at that will solve and bring money. Um, and, and yeah, so there's a point in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, and, and what David and Andrew described, I mean, it really puts a core challenge to the way, um, you know, jo yeah, economic support systems work in, in most countries that concentrate. Uh, very much on job creation, which usually means, uh, you know, um, full-time <laughs> full jobs in a, in a company. And I think we, you know, we, we really have to move away from and recognize um, that, you know, jobs, uh, you know, job creation takes place in these kind of networks Andrew's, uh, Andrew's so very um, well described. Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to move to the next issue, and um, this is um, well uh, something that was not so much visible immediately when the um, lockdown measures started, uh, and this is really this drop uh, in investment in future production, and this brings us back to the specific business models of uh, creative sectors when uh, people, well, artists, designers, uh, uh, go to festivals, book fairs not only to present them, but also to conclude deals for future production. And this uh, drop in investment uh, is felt now and will be felt also in the months to come uh, as uh, all these uh, events and festivals are still being postponed and cancelled. Um, and this is something we were discussing also with Jose Josephine over the past months, and she was the one who really highlighted this problem like uh, six months ago already. Um, but, and, and well, obviously this has an, a dramatic impact on the uh, incomes of creative professionals. Uh, but beyond uh, this immediate income support measures, uh, how can policies encourage investment in cultural production in the future? And maybe I can direct this question again to Andrew and Josephine. So what's your take on this? Josephine, do you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, what Katya, what what you described is the the issue international market access uh, and and um, you know and the, the recognition that uh, internationalization for creative industries works just really differently uh, than in other business sectors and therefore it needs other formats than than established trade fairs. And um, the issue you also mentioned is the whole issue of the copy. I mean, creative industries are a core copyright industry and it's not, you know, even if this locked, uh, current lockdown is over, it's not like a restaurant where you can, you know, just open the doors and serve food again and, and, and you know, serve beer. Uh, it's not like a hairdresser who also just has to open the door and, you know, can immediately um, have a revenue stream uh, again. It's very different in everything that has to do with live production and live events and live culture. Um, so, you know, the planning horizons, uh, they are, um, you know, if I speak to our live uh, event sector, uh, the, the planning horizon is between six months and two years, depending on the artist and the, and, and the location. Um, so they cannot just start over <laughs> again. And um, we also, uh, and Katja, we talked about this months before, the, the whole issue of copyright. So every concert that is not played at the moment does not only mean um, the, the income from this concert um, is lost and you know the income from the merchandise and the CDs and uh, everything and stickers that are sold there are lost for the bands and the cultural managers and the labels uh, and the, 
you know, all the service providers, the freelance service providers connected with it. But it also means that in the next year, so so in the next year and the year after the next year, there will be a tremendous loss in revenue from uh, copyright um, uh, income. And this is not on the um, agenda of politics at the moment, or I don't see it, <laughs> uh, at, at least because um, uh, as, as David also mentioned, the, the, the current support schemes, they focus, you know, on either compensating or social benefits, or there are, um, um, uh, you know, um, uh, depend on, on uh, previous turnover, etc. Um, but they don't uh, recognize that the, the, yeah, the future drops, tremendous drops in uh, uh, copyright income for for artists and everybody uh, involved in the sector. Um, yeah, and um, it's maybe a thought that ties into some of the earlier points um, when we when we talked about the furlough scheme and the the job retention scheme, where you could put people on retention but you weren't allowed them to work. That made businesses very very nervous. So in my business, I was everyone, no one will do a single piece of work that is on furlough and. You know, for a lot of these event-based business, now I can understand why why it's happened because, to David's point, we've got pulling and pushing of economic um, and, and commercial aspects, but we've also got health, and so I can understand the, f the retention scheme. No one do anything because then that keeps people in their home. But perhaps a little tweak is don't do anything physically out with the home, but if you're in the home allow desk-based work to happen because then for all the events-based businesses they can they can they can adapt they can do things they can then generate and take these physical events that used to happen that are so important to production happening and we can take them and we can do them online because those businesses can then creatively find solutions um to those problems um in terms of production it's been so helpful for businesses like ours that we were allowed to go and do physical production again but i have noticed huge um innovation now in the industry in terms of um there, there there's a new type of production in, and if anybody has watched the mandalorian right this was filmed using what's called virtual production this technology has 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 moved about a hundred times in the last couple of months um, my business, we are now in a joint venture with a, a company in London, and it's it's basically a technology that moves on from green screen, where you, you film against large LED panels. And it means the, the COVID uh, restricted benefits are that you can now shoot multiple locations in one location in a very short time. For example, um, we're working on a shoot where we would normally have to fly around the world to nine different places, which would take nine weeks potentially, and we can do it in one day in nine hours, right? And so I suppose some of the support that could be very beneficial, which would be amazing for the planet because it stops all of that travel and is, is thinking about how supporting innovation and technology and grants and money towards technologies like that that solve these problems um and you know i suppose more of these the, the great thing about technologies like that are that you can control them as safe as possible in a in a covid restricted environment because because of the how it works you can you can you can plan timing so you can you can understand how many people need to be on set and need to be there i was also approached very recently by a, a group of freelance um, producers and um, film people who wanted to create a, um, a, a group level access to, to, to filming equipment. Everyone has had to move online and everyone is having to produce content, but a lot of freelancers, they, they don't have access to the equipment and they don't have access to the technology because it's, it's very expensive. So I suppose another, another thing that could be beneficial is is shared access to technology or or, or equipment yes yeah, like pooling of resources right yeah Ex exactly yeah yeah 
But maybe uh, building on what you um, were saying, Andrew, well, clearly this massive push for digital is not temporarily, and it can indeed provide opportunities for new jobs uh, uh, in the future. But of course, we all say that uh, for this to happen, uh, digital skills gaps need to be addressed at um, people uh, at individual and firm level. So maybe I wanted to ask this uh, question to all uh, speakers, uh, if you want. Uh, so how can policies uh, support and address this going forward to support this massive push for digital in the future? So it also uh, uh, brings money and income to creative professionals and so on. Um, Josephine? To put, to put it bluntly, digital skills alone won't solve the problem because as Andrew said, you have to find a way uh, in order to monetize on them. You know, in, in, in my city, they, they just launched a platform now where you can, you know, we've seen all this uh, streaming uh, from, you know, concert halls and from clubs, etc. But only a small part uh, in the last month you know, really paid off uh, for, for for the artists and and, and creators and and the, and the uh, venues. Uh, so um, digital skills um, are you know only one side of the medal. We have to find ways uh, in how cultural and creative entrepreneurs can really capitalize uh, on them, and that's the you know maybe the core question to be, be solved. Um, Barbara, at the EU level, uh, what's your take on, on this? Yes, definitely. That's a tough one. And some of the colleagues in the commission the competition departments and others, they are, that's their struggle with the platforms to see, you know, to get a bit more of, uh, uh, to tackle the value gap, as it's called meaning basically the streaming revenues are going to a large extent to the platforms to a very and actually decreasing extent and that's the worrying part less and less extent to the people who are actually doing the creations the music and the films on uh, on on many of uh, of those platforms so that's that's a huge struggle and uh, it it will take some time and you know the commission continuously sues <laughs> different platforms uh, tries to to do new legislation uh, you know stop the loopholes so it, it's that's a that's a huge struggle on the other hand what else can be done um i just wanted to yeah to show you something else Yeah, can you see my screen? Yes. So that's also the digital is everywhere now. So just uh, shortly ago, the, um, the EU now has a digital education action plan for the next uh, years. I just wanted to highlight some things which could be of interest to you. It will create a European digital skills certificate that is uh, recognized and accepted by governments, employers and others across Europe so that you can also digitally um, recognize skills, then set up a new EU digital education hub, propose council recommendation, recommendation on improving the provision of digital skills in education and training, sharing good practice, working with industry to identify and update skills needs. Well, that will take some time. Uh, what else? Sorry. Yes, then there is the new digital Europe program where there is going to be uh, quite a lot of money involved. And I, I just looked up for you, what does it do concerning education and culture? So it uh, will provide creators and creative industries in Europe with access to latest digital, digital technologies from AI to advanced computing, uh, work with European cultural heritage, establish a network of digital innovation hubs that's already underway, but there will be more money available there. Yeah, just I wanted to mention briefly a few initiatives which are already working on skills and cultural and creative industries like here, the, the FLIP project and uh, on cultural heritage there's also uh, and skills there's also work ongoing. In any case, this is um, a lot of work in progress and uh, yeah, I think it will, it, it will as, as, as Andrew said, I mean, it's basically also about a many many new ways which will disrupt how we work 
what uh, you know our working methods and and revenue methods for culture and creative sector. So we are in the middle of of, of an industrial revolution here. So maybe I could uh, jump in with a point. So I, I've got I've got lots of ideas on this 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 area, and I'm uh, very excited. Um, the you know I think there a real positive is that we have all had to transform digitally, and it's moved every business a hundred or a thousand times. You know, it's moved us ten years in advance. You know, a year ago, if we'd all sat here, most of the people on this call wouldn't have known how to use Zoom, wouldn't have known how to use digital platforms. So I think there's a great a great thing that we need to realize that has happened. And so that's moved everyone's skill set. I think, however, is is now that we are all on an evil even playing ground online, is that for, for companies to succeed, for the events-based businesses to do the best, again, they need equipment like I've got here. I've I, over the last nine months, I've improved mine to try and move me up <laughs> again from the, the, the playing ground. So people need that support. However, there, there's also a lot of the soft skills that, that, that for education that need to come in terms of everyone has now, you know, some people used to get business from networking events. Some people used to bump into people in the coffee shop and, and different places. The only place at the moment and for the foreseeable future is to find business online. Now to do that, we need to understand our own personal brands. We need to we need to understand how to communicate online and how to do that effectively. So there's that type of learning. Now we could create external learning platforms, right? But to build platforms to create content costs a lot of money and it takes time. What I did at the beginning of COVID is I I moved someone into the position of head of people and culture because I realized and learning and development and because I realized. We're going to need to focus on that because we're going to need to look after our people, but also we're going to need to retrain and rethink about how we do everything. So my learning and development person in Made Brave has never been busier. They are probably the busiest person. And that's us. We've been doing training internally on for everybody to learn how to create their best personal brand so that I could have my whole company come online. So suddenly instead of me being the only person that's on LinkedIn to bring business, I've got an army of 50 people doing that. Okay. Now, so instead of taking money and building platforms and educational tools, which 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 is almost wasted on software, let give people funding for one role in their business. Give them pay for a learning and development manager to go into businesses. It will help with people's mental health. It will train from the inside out. So you've got someone that will coach and help. It will help all that of the learning development community and it will help businesses solve the problems themselves because training externally is good to a point, but but if we can put the help and the seed and plant that internally, I think it could be much more beneficial. Yes, super. thanks so much, Walwa. While some of us are thinking, what can be done? You have done it. <laughs> so, fantastic. David, I don't know if you want to say a few words um, about this, well, bridging the digital divides and maybe some reactions to what uh, other speakers uh, were, were saying just now. No, I, I tend to agree generally with, with everything that was said. I think the two key points are funding and learning. Um, funding in the sense that, you know, in, in most of these jobs and sectors that we're talking about, we have to remember that there's a pipeline and there's an ecosystem. And um, I think it was Josephine that said, you know, it's not just something that we can flick the switch and uh, they're back working. Um, a music production, a book, a theater production, um, these take years to do. And so we have to realize that um, what's happening now or what's happened in the past year is going to have consequences two, three, four, or five years down the road for these workers. So we have to ensure that the funding is there um, so that this gap uh, has uh, minimal consequences in the future. Uh, similarly with the ecosystem, you know, we might see the actor on the stage or the musician who's playing the music, but behind that, there are all kinds of other workers who may or may not be captured when we're looking at um, Statistics, for example, you know, the lighting designers, the managers, the all the people who do all the other behind the scenes work. Um, we have to make sure that these people are also supported because if these people disappear, um, the artists and, and the creative people will have a much more difficult time pursuing their craft. 
And then learning, I think, is critical. Uh, clearly, digital is one element of it. But I think, you know, based on my own experience over the past 20 years working part time in, in the arts, I think financial literacy is hugely important. And um, we also have to help people in recognizing opportunities. And this links to what Andrew was saying around branding. And um, so there's training that can be done, but I think also peer learning is important not to overlook as well, because I have seen many examples of people with fantastic ideas of creating new income streams online. And I would think to myself, ah, if only this other person was doing the same thing, I would be all over that. And um, so there's a lot that, that uh, the creative workers can learn from each other. So we need to somehow set up systems around, I don't know, associations or, or unions or depends on in, on the country, but where this information exchange can occur. Yeah, super. Thank you very much. Josephine, you wanted to add something to this? Yeah, what, what Andrew just uh, implemented is what we would call on an abstract level, a community of practice. And this is um, a concept that um, we that very much guides also uh, the work in, in our network. And we've seen a lot of peer learning in our networks during the last months. And for example, in, instead of building, you know, big platforms and producing content, etc., we propose to our uh, regional government to, to fund, you know, digital agents that would, you know, not only within the creative sector, but so the, the, the competences that develop within the creative sector in the digital, in, in terms of digital skills, you know, other business sector need that as well now. And so we propose, you know, fund for, for a year or one and a half years, um, uh, give us some funding for, for digital agents where we finance uh, people from the creative sector and enable this, this uh, peer learning uh, among companies instead of, you know, having this huge, uh, you know, a, a huge platform or just another uh, public um, education institution on, on digital skills, you know, to keep it really on eye level and on, on firm uh, yeah, B, B2B learning, peer learning processes. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Josephine. Um, well, um, uh, maybe a, a final round of questions um, I wanted to ask maybe to all panelists. We spoke quite a lot about uh, national level policies, now uh, income support, unemployment supports, etc. <clears throat> but uh, quite a lot can be done at city or regional level to complement this, to put uh, own uh, programs uh, in place. So if we think uh, about the coming months, uh, uh, what are the maybe top three for two most important uh, things local governments uh, should, could do to support jobs in the sector and to make it more resilient also in the future. Maybe your top three recommendations for your city government or well, city governments or local governments uh, more in, in, in general. Uh, maybe uh, well, who would like to, to start with that? Well, maybe David, let's go for, to David. All right, thank you. I think I'll just add one additional idea. I think we talked in the last round of, of um, questions about the points I was going to make, but I think there's one new one I would introduce and that is planning ahead. I think, you know, we're coming out of winter into the spring. I think that the local governments need to be planning ahead on how public spaces and parks can be used to help get uh, some of the performing arts back. Um, we can set up outdoor stages in, in all kinds of various um, settings and um, since they're outdoors, the social distancing measures um, are much more easier to manage. And similarly, as the vaccinations roll out, we need to think about how we can um, utilize that. Uh, obviously, it's going slowly in some countries, but other countries are quite advanced, and we hope this picks up in the spring. Um, but I've already heard in, in some discussions around sports, for example, about how the professional leagues are planning on bringing uh, fans back into the arenas if they can prove that they've had a vaccination. And so we need to be thinking about these issues already and anticipating how we can get uh, many of these performances and um, other arts back performing in front of the public. I can jump in. I think to build on David's idea of planning ahead, it's it's not to think 
that when everything opens up, we're going to go back to the same normal as before. It's making sure the support is there for businesses to to how their offices will be used and what those turn into. Um, I very much believe that the future of the workplace will be a blended uh, approach in terms of, uh, as I mentioned, we we are opening our company up to work from anywhere and we will encourage work from home if you want to work from the office and we very much hope that our office will become a destination for our brand, somewhere people want to come to, but somewhere they don't have to. However, um, the office will look, look different. Just now, we're all on this call and we all have an individual private booth um, where, where we are able to jump in and jump out, out of calls, right? We're all privately in our own little pods. When we go back to the office, the world is still going to be blended in terms of some people will be in offices, some people will still be at home. And so offices are going to very much need to transform where they will need multiple privacy booths for, for individual Zoom calls, hangouts to happen, while also um, the general working of an office. That's going to require significant investment from companies. Um, the boardroom is going to look very different in terms of you're going to have people in a meeting in a workshop where some people will be on Zoom, some people will not. So businesses have to transform very quickly their 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 conference and call setups and and how that happens in Scotland um there was just recently a digital boost grant um which was twenty five thousand pounds and it opened and closed within a couple of hours um and it was there to support with the techno technological input that businesses might need so I, th I think that's a, a a very important thing to to be thinking about and not just to be thinking about, um, you, you know, the, the kind of employment parts. There's the, the the transformation physically that businesses are going to have to do is is going to be quite significant. Yes, Josephine, please. Yeah, Katya, you already mentioned that local budgets are under high pressure. Um, at this time, it's especially crucial that still, um, you know. Um, local governments do not only focus on public cultural institutions, but that they now strategically invest in the independent cultural sector. I think that's a, it's a key point you can act upon on a local level. Um, and also what I mentioned, you know, in terms of internationalization, touring, mobility of artists, if you fund a production on a local level, you know, you lose, it's usually a project funding, um, but why not only, uh, why not also fund a touring of this production? So, so once you invest in a production, you know, why not scale it up with this local budget in order to, you know, enable a, a additional revenue streams from this uh, seed funding, I would say, in cultural protection. And um, another aspect we did not talk about yet is obviously the real estate market uh, space development. Andrew touched upon it, you know, um, with the challenges that businesses are facing with these, uh, uh, all the new hybrid uh, formats and workshops. Um, we already see businesses closing within the city centers already. Uh, so this could be a chance for cultural and creative industries who have been pushed aside um, uh, over increasing rents uh, in the last years. Um, and here cities can, can play a moderating role, uh, could initiate a dialogue between the private real estate uh, sector and cultural businesses. This could really uh, be a chance. I know the city of London, I, I talked to a colleague of Justin Simmons um, last year, they have uh, initiatives in this direction ongoing. And I think this is um, an important uh, effort and, and a chance uh, to, you know, to, to strategically invest in, in new spaces <laughs> um, that don't only have to be, you know, entrepreneurial, that can be, you know, that you can um, fill with um, multiple content, I would say. <laughs> No, absolutely. That's a very strong point uh, related to real estate. And over the past years, everyone was saying, well, subsidize rents for artists, et cetera, et cetera. But now, well, and also try to avoid gentrification. And, but now maybe this is a really, it's an opportunity to bring artists back into the city centers, indeed. That's yeah. what I see. And, and uh, one very last argument, because uh, you, you said we should restrict ourselves, but, and, and Katya knows that I always make this point when we talk to each other, 
trust in bottom-up networks, trust in you know the the, the entrepreneurial networks you, you have in your in your city, and give them uh, at least some you know core funding in order to initiate networking activities because it really pays off. No, absolutely. And I think, um, well, as you know, we were through this project, we're working with a number of regions in Europe. And what you just said, Josephine, uh, reminded me of what uh, people are doing in Emilia Romagna. And they are really putting an emphasis on what, what they call creative spaces. So it's more or less what you were explaining. So uh, the, the role of the public sector is to support the spaces where experimentation can take and, uh, uh, well, this bottom up approach can, can develop. Uh, Barbara, maybe you can share with us um, your thoughts on what uh, cities and regions are doing to uh, support employment in, in creative sectors in, in the future. Yes, I was thinking along the same lines as uh, the other speakers concerning empty offices, Andrew and uh, David. Uh, I wanted to say that some of my colleagues in the European Parliament actually, since their offices have been empty now, they are migrants and homeless people living in their offices and uh, also some other offices are used for you know um, health uh, testing and, and other covid related activities it's of course like josephine was saying a huge real estate problem people moving outwards as was yesterday mentioned in another panel the suburbanization the city centers and offices, uh, I don't know how that's going to play out. So that's going to be a huge task for, for local governments. Uh, then in general, uh, there has been a OMC, Open Method of Coordination Experts um, group thinking about ahead already, that was two years ago. And one of the big recommendations was actually to local governments saying that they should uh, they should give empty buildings or disaffected buildings to culture and creative uh, um, spaces and, you know, give them the ownership also, not only give them a loan and then, uh, or, or even worse, like a temporary use so that the space is hyped and then the real estate developer takes it over the higher, uh, you know, higher revenue, but actually give them the ownership. And there is uh, interesting um, good practice like Kapele in Finland, they're part of uh, the EU Creatives Hubs Network, which we also uh, help to set up. So some of those creative hubs, actually they are owners of huge industrial buildings, which the city government simply gave to them because it was a building which was to them a problem. So what they did, for example, they got a loan from the bank since they were owners of the building, it was easier for them to get a loan and to get it renovated themselves. And now they don't have to, to, to fear being thrown out. So there's a lot of uh, good practice out there. It just needs to be, to, be, to be used and to learn from each other. And uh, as you all were saying, COVID actually even makes the point stronger with uh, empty spaces going to be a huge problem for local governments in particular. Yeah, and, and maybe just to add on to that point is that, you know, I, I think, unfortunately, we're going to see all the, the, the city centre retailers collapse and not survive. And, and perhaps that was that was already inevitable, you know, because of digital transformation and e-commerce. It was, you know, we were on a path there. It's just happened faster because of this. But I, I do think that the, the businesses will no longer have the big offices, but they still need an office because we have to remember that not everyone is fortunate to, to have a living environment where they, it's conducive to, to home working. So if we can convert these small retail places uh, uh, into and supply funding to turn them into cultural hubs or workplace hubs that are much smaller, um, you know, we can then use the bigger buildings for for other other reasons, but you could turn that city centre into smaller destinations for brands. So businesses can share offices. So it, it, they're more like coffee shops, more like places that the employees can can go from home to there if they if, if they need to get away. Because we also have to remember about mental health, and people need to be together for that. Um, you know, we all some people have home environments where they're caring for people or where you know it's just not a nice environment so i think in anything that can help bring people together obviously in a safe environment as and when we can i i, I think could be positive um, I, and it brings life back to the cities in a way that's that's more sustainable than than what we have at the moment yeah thank you thank you very much well i think it's it's really uh 
very this provides very good elements for a culture-led urban recovery strategy no that's really uh, um fantastic um maybe uh we'll, to conclude we can uh have a look at the questions uh some of them were already answered that we have from our participants and i wanted to also to highlight uh, um this espon project on uh well-being well well-being was referred today and yesterday so maybe um, um I encourage you to have a look at the project website and it uh, aims to measure uh, this connection between um, culture, cultural participation, heritage and well-being. Uh, and we also had maybe that's more for Barbara, um, a question on the guarantee facility, uh, asking whether it's worth to maybe keep it uh, uh, apart from other funding uh, instruments for another couple of years to consolidate its facts. Yeah, that's one of those struggles. Um, you know, it's about fencing off funding for culture and creative sectors so that uh, they would not have to compete against other more, more faster movers in other sectors. I completely support what, what is being said. Uh, of course, it doesn't, you know, we have to, to lobby for that because from a, from a funding perspective, of course, it's easier not to provide SME or seed funding to specific sectors, but to say, well, it's for all, uh, you know, small entrepreneurs in, in all sectors. Uh, yes, I mean, <laughs> now, basically, we need to, to, to make sure that our sectors know about these possibilities so that they can actually use massively those funding instruments. Uh, because unfortunately, the EU industrial policy, they, they, don't, they don't like to uh, work in sector approaches. So they work for all SMEs, like employment uh, policies. Also, they do not work sectorally. They work for all freelancers. So every time, for example, we want to argue for, for measures for culture and creative freelancers, they say, well, but what about, uh, you know, the Uber Eats people, the bicycle, you know, they also need protection, which, of course, it's, it's, it's true also, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's one of those struggles. Yes, thank you, Barbara. Um, I don't know if our speakers want to make any, kind of any final remarks, maybe some ideas that you really wanted to share and forgot. Um, um, maybe a, a leaving final point for me is that when we're in times of challenge and times of trouble, we need creative people. Creative people solve problems. And so, you know, any support that we can give to creative people to allow them to create solutions and to get out of flight or fright is the best thing I believe that we can do. Well, fantastic. That's a fantastic concluding comment. Uh, and uh, really, uh, it was it is such an honor to be uh, working with us, uh, Scotland. Land of hope, really. You give us <laughs> hope to, to all of us. Uh, so with that, maybe I would like to thank you to thank our speakers. Uh, and we can close this session and we, we will meet again at 11.45. So you can grab a coffee and I'll see you at 11.45. Thank you.